Hello and thank you for joining us today at Swiping Through History. I am here with the wonderful Mike Ingram. Thank you, Mike, for being with us once again. <laughs> thank you for having me again. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, we have something a little bit different for you guys today because normally we'd be looking in more detail at the Battle of Wakefield. However, unfortunately, we don't really have any more detail about the Battle of Wakefield. The whole key, uh, unique nature of that battle is that we know very little about it. So most of it was covered in the documentary that we released last week. But we are going to take the opportunity instead to tackle the Wars of the Roses head on today and really look into detail at what it is, why it started, and try and dispel some of the myths that have kind of developed around the Wars of the Roses. So Mike is here, he's gonna show us, he's got this brilliant little presentation to show us all and talk us through. So Mike, I'll hand it over to you and let's get started. Thank you very much, here we go. Right, so let, let's start really by just having a quick look at actually what England was like during the time of the Wars of the Roses. Mm. So the population was around two and a half million. Which to put in context is smaller than the population of London today. <laughs> so exactly. The, pop the population of the entire country was smaller than what it is in the capital today. Yeah, exactly. And when you start talking about Towton later on, and they start throwing these huge numbers out of how many people died, Mm. And you re and you work out how big a percentage of the of the population is supposedly killed in the ba in the battle. It shows you that it can't be right. Eighty percent of the population was employed in agriculture and lived in the countryside. It was a rural economy. Uh, wool and cloth were the main products. To give you some ideas of, of sizes, London had about population of about forty thousand. York was the next biggest with 12,000 and the third one which is always a surprise is Bristol with 10,000. Um, and to look at the nobility of England at the time, uh, altogether there was 60 dukes, marquises, earls, viscounts and barons. So that's the upper echelon of the, the nobility of England. Below that we had about 1,100 knights and about 10,000 esquires and gentlemen. So they're the low, lowest level of the of the nobility of England. So that's okay. your pool that you've got to fight from. The numbers do change so over, I have, over time. I, ha I have a quick question for you then while we're here. Uh, recently hmm. we released a little documentary about Grafton Regis which covers the, the Woodville family uh, and goes yes, into a little yes. bit of detail about their, them and their story. Now hmm. it's, it's well known that um, Duquetta actually married uh, lower than herself um, to uh, the, the Woodville. So where would he have fit on this kind of, shall we say, pyramid of the nobility? Would he, would he have been one of the 1100 knights or would he have been even lower than that, uh, an esquire or a gentleman? Where, where would, do you know where he might have been placed in that? Well, he, he should have been actually in the, in the knight's level, but because Jaquetta is the second highest ranking woman in England, it does uh, jack him up slightly. Yeah, but obviously is also why people, uh, the other nobility, got a little bit frustrated about it, I would imagine. Why the Woodville, yes. they, they, they weren't believed to be of true noble birth. They, they were almost little above commoners. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's what, that was always one of the big arguments that comes along during this period. Um, so what was the Wars of the Roses? Uh, simply, really, it was a series of connected rebellions that lasted 37 years and we'll mention that when we talk about the name in a, in a while. There was five kings and seven reigns, there was 10 coup d'etats, 15 invasions of which only five were successful, five usurpations of the throne and 16 battles starting with first battle of St Albans and ending with the battle of Stoke. There's also numerous sieges and failed rebellions that fit in that time too as well but they're, they're, they're not really counted as, as major battles. So you can break the wars down into a series of phases. It's always, a, it's always a debate when actually you say the Wars of the Roses started from. Mm. Uh, most people take it's, fr it's actually from St Albans, but the very first rebellion involving the Yorkists uh, is in 1450, which is Jack Cade's rebellion. Um, so, I always think that's that's where it starts. 
and that then really runs to 1459 uh, until we start to get to the battles that we've already spoke about. St. Yeah, Oldham and the first, and the first battle, which is where we begin our series because we look at all of those battles, is that 1455, the first battle of St. Albans, isn't it? Ex exactly, yes. So it, it's in that period. Mm. So the second phase really is the War of Succession, who's going to be King of England, uh, which starts in 1460 with a prelude with Bloor Heath and, and Ludford Bridge. But the first proper battle is Northampton, as we've yeah. already covered uh, in 1460, and goes on until Edward defeats all the Lancastrians uh, in 1465. Wow. Then the next phase, so there's a long period of peace from 65 to 69, uh, and that is when Neville, the Warwick the Kingmaker, starts his rebellion. And we start to see the return of the Lancastrians, uh, as in Margaret of Anjou, which will be later stories that we talk she, about. She doesn't give up easily, does she? I mean, we talk oh, no, about her doesn't. a lot. And, and she really is a, you know, a powerhouse of a figure. And, and she just doesn't quit. <laughs> no, no. And, and she keeps going, really, of course, until her son's killed at the Battle of Tewkesbury. Mm. Uh, and then uh, Henry VI is uh, murdered, probably at that time. So you've got you've got till got that till 1471. You then have another long period of peace right until 1483, when we get the rise of Richard III and Henry Tudor. So they're they're the key phases of the, the whole story. I guess story. this is <laughs> excuse me. I guess this is why it's called the Wars of the Roses rather than War of the Roses. I feel like that's a little misconception that a lot it, it we often have. We see, we see it written a lot, actually, where people call it the War of the Roses, but actually it's not one war. It is a series of conflicts. Uh, and as a result, in a way, one of those myths that we need to kind of dispel today is that, is that it's not one conflict. It is a series of conflicts that has kind of been categorized together in its uh, in its kind of retelling of the story, exactly, and it, it's it's a series of rebellions rather than than a war as mm. we would know a war today, I suppose. Uh, so, what started it? The reasons are huge and many, but some of the key ones is the weak and ineffectual king. There was a weak economy, the loss of France, the rise of bastard feudalism. So now, you get that? the person. Let's, let's it, it's the personal them. affinities. It, it's the personal affinities of, of the nobles. Right. When nobles are handing out their badges to people. Um, ah, okay. So you're, you're getting um, your football team supporters uh, analogy coming into play there. Um, and so on and so forth as well. So that, that's where that sort of really comes from. Uh, you're also starting to get a breakdown of law and order because Henry's an ineffectual king. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you get a lot of feuding between the powerful families, such as the Nevilles and Percy's, are having one feud um, in the north of England. And then you've got the Bonvilles and the Courtney's having another major feud down in Devon. Uh, and they're, they're blood feuds. They mm. go on for a long while. They're not, you know, sort of, oh, we don't like you, burn his house down and it's over. Yeah. Um, it goes on for long periods of time and they do change sides mm. nobles change sides to suit themselves um where they where they think they're going to get the best deal basically so much for all the chivalry we uh, we love to talk about nowadays <laughs> uh, sh chivalry was long dead by this point long dead um and then the other one which which is quite key is the ostracizing of richard of york um he was by rights um, for a long part until Henry's son's born, um, the next in line for the throne. Mm. Uh, but he is kept out by Margaret as much as anybody else, uh, and and Somerset from taking his rightful place. So there is always the outstanding question: was that if we, the country got all the problems, but if Richard of York had been allowed to take his place and do what he wanted to? Um, just as the senior noble, then there's a very good chance that the Wars of the Roses wouldn't happen at all. Because he would have supported Henry and he would have put down the problems um, in the breaking down of law and order and the like. Mm. And overall, it was just a period of massive change. 
um, the loss of France was a huge change. Um, militarily, you've got the rise of gunpowder uh, and, all, and all these sorts of things. Because obviously we often, you know, categorize history, don't we? We often say, okay, the Hundred Years' War is a period of history and the First World War is a period of history and, and you know, the Wars of the Roses is a period of history. But what we often do by doing that is, is we, we forget how they can often all be, they're often interlinked. You know, and yes. I think this is quite clear then here, what you're saying is that the Hundred Years War is very much the reason, one of the significant reasons as to why the Wars of the Roses developed in the way that it did. Yeah, uh, and following on f or, or included in that, um, you've got a lot of unemployed soldiers coming back to England who used to, were used to roaming free in France and pillaging and plundering and making themselves very rich in in France, so they then not having anything else, they start to attach themselves to the to the powerful nobility in the families. Yeah. Um, although by the end of the war, that of course is gone. But but at the start of the war, you do have this lot of experienced unemployed soldiers wandering around, causing havoc in England, which yeah. then adds to the breakdown of the law and order, and and so on and so forth. Now, if we if we just move on. One of the big myths of, of all of this is this myth of the two roses and you can see this in this 1908 painting by Henry Payne uh, which supposedly is in Temple Garden and you've got Richard of York plucking the white rose and you've got um, Somerset picking the red rose. Uh, this, this all follows on from Shakespeare and we know what Shakespeare is like as a historian but it, <laughs> it, it, gives, it gives you an idea of how this myth um, start, starts to perpetuate. Yeah. And in the same way, Lancashire v Yorkshire. Um, Lancashire and Yorkshire don't fight each other at all, uh, really. What it is, is more a war of north versus south. Yeah. With the Lancastrians hold, holding a line really from, I suppose, parts of Wales and uh, north of Northampton, um, being Lancastrian and south of Northampton um, being all the Yorkists. So it's got absolutely nothing to do with the uh, with Lancashire and Yorkshire. I think I've said this before, but York was actually a Lancastrian town. Exactly, it, yes. It always makes me chuckle because, you know, it's the house of York, but York is Lancastrian, you know, <laughs> and it's kind of, it shows really how this myth has developed that, you know, and I think it's in terms of like sporting and and, and Kind of uh, you know the competitive nature. It's great that you've got the whole York versus Lancaster, uh, Lancashire, but at the same time, it's it's it, it, as you say, it, it's all it's all a myth. It's actually got yeah. nothing to do with the Wars of the Roses whatsoever. It, it just so happens that on one side was the Duke of Lanc Lancaster, and on the other side was the Duke of York. When they very rarely actually visited those areas. Um, and, and in fact, the, the River Trent uh, was really the dividing line between the two between the two sides, and you almost needed a passport to cross the River Trent. Oh wow! Uh, to, to go into Lancastrian territory. In fact, the Red Rose of Lancaster, uh, the earliest associations with it come from Henry the Fourth. Um, he's the first king of the House of Lancaster, of course, and he had red roses decorating his pavilion at a joust in 1398. Um, so, so that's that's where the red rose comes from. Of course, it's not really used again, right up until Henry the Seventh's on the throne, when he uses that red rose and combines it with the uh, with the white rose to sort of say, okay, the war's over now. The two families are combining together. Yeah, that's that's actually Henry the Sixth badge, the the white swan, um, and and he used that, and it would be on his banners. Uh, and Margaret would have used it on her banners uh, through most of the, the periods of the fighting. Um, the other thing that was um, key to spotting a, a Lancastrian was they would have a collar of S's, which you can see here, um, and you would have various attachments. So imagine this with a white swan underneath it mm. at the time of Henry VI, that's what they would be wearing. This, as I say, is a later one. It's a, it's a Henry VII one with the combined rows of um, York and Lancaster in the middle, with the two Beaufort portcullises on either side. 
so it, it comes from there. So if, if you spotted a, a noble wearing one of these, you would know he was a Lancastrian. The white rose, on the other hand, traditionally the origins of the emblems are said to go back to the Mortimer Earls of March, which is where the um, Yorkist claim of the throne actually came from. Right. Uh, and, and it's a dog rose rather than the, the rose we know it today. That's Edward IV badge with his white rose in the centre and the sun in splendour around the outside. The sun in splendour was a badge um, that he started using after the Battle of Mortimer's Cross, which we'll which be talking about next. is our next battle, right? Exactly. So we don't just throw this together. We, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so keep an eye out for this, because this is, this is interesting when we talk about heraldry, when you think about uh, the, the kings and the nobles, their badges and things, often, you know, they played around with them and they took things that inspired them or, or you know, they chose animals that they kind of related to or whatever it is. And, and with Mortimer's Cross, there's a there's a really awesome story about why Edward takes up the, 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 the symbol of the sun. Um, and we'll be covering that in our next episode. So make sure you, uh, you keep track of that. Yes. And this, this, is the, this is the Yorkist badge. It's a bit worn, but you can just about make out um, on the on the collar, um, the sun in splendors and the white roses, and of course hanging from it is the boar badge, um, which Richard III uses. Yeah. So it, it shows you that that connection from the two. Going back to heraldry, we can look at how complicated heraldry was actually getting, and I'm using here the example um, of the of the Nevilles, and particularly. Uh, Richard Neville, Warwick the Kingmaker. Um, so you can see here Ralph Neville with his basic um, white cross marries Joan Beaufort, who has got quite quite a more complicated badge. Mm -hmm. um, and then their son, Richard Earl of Salisbury, he takes the two sides. So you can see there where he's got the still got the um, the Westmoreland cross, yeah. but then you've got it add, added to it the blue and the white of the Beauforts. He in turn then goes and marries Alice Montecuti, who's the Countess of Salisbury. Who was such so, a cutie. <laughs> exactly. So, so that then combines those two sets of badges together. And you get this one. This is Richard, Richard the, their son, Richard the Earl of Warwick. He goes and marries Anne Beecham, the Countess of Warwick. She comes from a noble family. So you've then got the, the Beecham badge and the dispenser badges coming into it. So by the time you get to um, Warwick the Kingmaker um, coming more powerful in his own right, that's the badge you get. <laughs> now, they, they didn't think about that when they started it, did they? At the very beginning no, they didn't. of the they didn't think, do you know what, in a few hundred years time, it's gonna look a right mess, but it anyway. Does. I mean, you imagine trying to find that on the battlefield. And everybody else, you just wouldn't see it. You wouldn't be able to identify it at all. Yeah, you it's wouldn't have any so idea. Complicated. Would you? No. So as a consequence of that, they start to use livery badges, which is much more simple. Here's Warwick's livery badges. Um, it's the bear and the ragged staff. You can see it much more clearly. It's easy identifiable. And that's still and the, the, the badge they use today when you go into Warwickshire, in Warwickshire, all around, you know, it, it, they use the bear and the ragged staff, don't they? Oh, they do. And, and that's where it comes from. That, that takes it back to that time. Uh, or, or also, as you can see here, on occasions, they would just use the ragged staff. So going back to the beginning, almost, what about this name as we started talking about the Wars of the Roses? Uh, the first time it's actually used is in a pamphlet in uh, the term Wars of the Roses is, is in a pamphlet in 1646 by a chap named Sir John Oglander. And he published a, um, a pamphlet entitled The Quarrel of the Warring Roses. That's the first reference we get to the. To the and Wars he's of the effectively Roses. just made that up himself, has he? Is exactly. that, is that, he's just, he's yep. just thought, oh, this creatively sounds good and, you know, we'll get people reading it. So he uses it, he plucks it out of complete thin air. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And then in 1762, David Hume, in his History of England, actually uses it slightly and calls it the Wars of the Two Roses. But again, it's still war, so it's still, it's still plural. And we're starting to see now how the myths start to develop. 
exactly exactly when you when you look at the historiography of it all this is where it all comes from and then in 1829 sir walter scott uses the the actual term wars of the roses in his novel anne of gearstein so that's the first time it's actually it actually comes into use um and then you know, the other um more modern one uh people started calling it the cousins wars that that's an entirely modern invention very probably as we started to say the actual wars themselves didn't have a name it would be warwick's rebellion or the duke of york's rebellion um, yeah they didn't live through the period going we are fighting in the wars of the roses oh that's no very, no exactly that's a very contemporary thing just to show you where the two lines of the, of the two families come from um, Ed, um these are the children of edward the third so Edward's eldest son and should be the next um, line of descent uh, is Edward the Black Prince, but of course he dies young uh, and their son uh, is Richard II. But again, he's usurped to the throne by Henry IV. So the line of the kingship moves from, from Edward across to John of Gaunt yeah. and, and his descendants, which you then get Henry IV, Henry V and of course Henry VI. At our Yorkist line actually comes from two sources from Lionel of Antwerp, the second son, uh, who was the Duke of Clarence, and she married he married Elizabeth de Burr, and the fourth line, the House of York. Really, you can see from that where where the the names come from. Mm. However, however, it's Lionel's claim is the strongest claim because obviously it goes down the line from eldest son to eldest son to eldest son. And so on. Um, Lionel of Antwerp actually. However, did, did um, Henry the Fourth claim it by a by a conquest to claim the the king. Yeah, basically, but it was it was sort of set up um, by John of Gaunt during Richard the Second's reign or towards the end of Richard's reign. Right. Um, that because Lionel was already dead, um, that rather than go through his de Lionel's descendants it goes through John's descendants. Um, it, they actually, John of Gaunt actually got the, the law changed slightly um, when Edward was on his deathbed. Um, whether Edward, because he was suffering badly from, Edward III was suffering badly from dementia at the time, whether it was real or John, in, uh, John of Gaunt invented it, which is yeah. another story. Um, but so, um, Lionel of Antwerp uh, had had um, had a daughter. She married into the Mortimer line, so that that was actually the senior line, and that's why the White Rose comes from, and and all of those. And then further down the line, um, Lionel of Antwerp's descendants marry the Duke of York's descendants, and that's where you get the combination of the two joining together, if that makes sense. Yes. Poor it's old Lionel. See, um, it's, it's really good to see, I think, for, for people watching, but also for myself. It, it, it's always so convoluted and confusing when you start looking at the kind of, you know, how things pass down and where it all kind of originates. But seeing it like this is, is very clear. So thanks for that. Yeah. And then, of course, you've got the extra bit on the end, which is Thomas of Woodstock, uh, the youngest son. It's his line that then goes towards the Dukes of Buckingham that are very much involved in the wars um, at Northampton, Buckingham's rebellion against Richard III and so on and so forth. Mm. So it, it comes in from there. So there you go. That, that's an introduction to the Wars of the Roses. I hopefully yeah, uh, I think picked up a few bits about it. Yeah, I think, I think that's fantastic, Mike, really, I do. I think it, what's so nice about that is we just cover, you know, really clearly, you know, what it is, the background to it, because actually it's a very complex period of history, you know, that has all the intricacy of, you know, modern day politics in a way, but just happened 500 years ago instead. So it, 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 I think for people who, number one, are, you know, don't necessarily know anything about the Wars of the Roses, this is a great starting point. And number two, for those who do, you know, to really kind of clarify, on, you know, that lineage, for example, where those things come in is, is, is perfect because it just kind of, it answers some of those questions that we 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 tackle in the documentaries, but we don't have enough time to go into real detail about them. 
So, no, I think this has been awesome, and, and thank you so much for sharing this with us. My pleasure as always. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.